Good morning. We'll start the session. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Marc-André Gaudreau. I'm the manager for strategic issues at uh, the Centre for Communicable Diseases and Infection Control within the Public Health Agency of Canada. The agency is the uh, focal point for the Government of Canada's response to HIV and AIDS, including the Canadian HIV Vaccines Initiative. I'm honored to be here this morning uh, on behalf of, to welcome you on behalf of the agency to this event, uh, aiming to learn about the development uh, of replicate, uh, replication competent vector vaccine for HIV and HIV novel prevention uh, technologies. The Canadian HIV Vaccine Initiative is a novel and innovative partnership among several government of Canada departments and agencies, including Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, and Industry Canada. The Government of Canada is also, uh, also values its partnership with the, uh, on the CGI with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a global leader in funding for HIV vaccine research. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Alliance Coordinating Office housed within the International Centre for Infectious Diseases in Winnipeg for taking the lead in planning this event this morning. I would now like to welcome and introduce our two highly distinguished guest speakers. First, Dr. Mark Gerwitt, who is currently the Chief Medical Officer of PaxVax in Redwood City, California, a biotech startup devoted to the development of vaccines, including candidate HIV vaccines. He previously was CMO at VaxGen, with which was developing vaccines, including the AIDSVAX BE, part of the HIV vaccine regimen in the RV144 trial in Thailand. Dr. Gerwitt has also held academic positions in infectious diseases at the University of Manitoba, University of Kansas, University of California in Los Angeles, and Michigan State University, where he, has, where he was the head of infectious diseases. He is the author of over 100 publications. He received his BA from Yale University in 1961, an MD from Harvard Medical School in 1965, and was also an epidemic uh, intelligence service officer for the CDC. He completed his uh, internal medicine and infectious diseases training at Stanford University, and he also holds a Juris Doctorate from Temple University. Our second speaker will be Dr. Frank Palmer, who is regarded internationally as a world leading expert in HIV research and an infectious disease specialist whose work has uh, influenced and inspired many uh, in terms of uh, public health policy in Canada and abroad. After completing his medical degree in clinical training, Dr. Plummer went to Nairobi in 1981 to study infectious diseases. In 1984, uh, Dr. Plummer returned to Kenya, where he spent the next 16 years researching sexually transmitted diseases and HIV AIDS. In the 1980s and 90s, Dr. Plummer led the University of Manitoba's sexually transmitted infections and HIV research and training program in Kenya. His studies on HIV epidemiology in Kenya were central to global understanding of the risk factors for HIV transmission and how to prevent its spread. Dr. Plummer returned to Canada in 2000 to become the head of the new National Microbiology Laboratory. In addition to heading the NML, Dr. Plummer also took on the role of Chief Science Advisor of the newly created Public Health Agency of Canada in 2004. Dr. Plummer has a stellar track record in publishing groundbreaking research with over 350 peer-reviewed articles in prominent scientific journals. Again, welcome to you all and thank you for being with us this morning. To go with. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak here and the opportunity to be back in Canada. I spent a number of years in Winnipeg and uh, really enjoyed uh, my time there. So I'm going to uh, uh, speak on uh, the replicating a vector vaccine approach uh, for HIV. And these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, I'm, I'm an employee of PaxVax, and conceivably sometime in the future, that may lead to some uh, financial gain for me, but, <laughs> but not, not recently. 
Um, so uh, this a quick outline of uh, what I want to speak about. The, first of all, the uh, why replicating vector approach for HIV vaccines, and then I'll divert and talk about uh, the Paxvax uh, replicating vector uh, for flu, which we've developed further as a model system for uh, uh, this, uh, for our HIV candidate. Then I'll talk about uh, um, some preliminary primate data, which we have for our replicating vector, HIV vectors, and a little about our phase one studies. So first of all, why replicating vectors in HIV vaccine? And um, there have been several IAVI-sponsored symposia on replicating vectors, and there's some reasons that, that to think that the uh, they have would have potential advantages in the, as an HIV vaccine. So first of all, uh, kind of the obvious, uh, they they're like attenuated HIV vaccines; they replicate, but uh, they don't have the risk of, of uh, HIV reversion as uh, was the experience with the SIV candidates. Um, uh, SIV looked very promising as a NHP vaccine and then there is reversion. So that's really stopped uh, any development of HIV vaccines, replicating HIV vaccines. So you have the safety of, of uh, killed vaccines, but in theory, possibly the immunogenicity of live vaccines. Uh, and then you, uh, at least in our case and a number of cases, you have the potential of replication at mucosal surfaces, so a mucosal vaccine. Uh, and they're likely to be cheaper. Uh, and because of replication, you may get a longer uh, duration of exposure, an adjuvanting effect. There's some disadvantages. Uh, one, there may not be as much, uh, you can only put, pack so much into your vector. Um, there may be viral interference if, you have, if you're giving two vectors like we do. We give an HIV uh, gag and an HIV envelope in separate vectors. And then there's always con concern about persistence, at least potential concern about persistence. Uh, so uh, how do you, uh, you know, how are the replicating vectors attenuated? Ours is by route. The adenovirus uh, is a respiratory pathogen, but when given orally or nasally, as long as it's not delivered into the lungs, it seems uh, safe. Uh, uh, there's a number of attenuated vaccine viruses that are used as vectors. There's some non-human uh, viruses that, are, that replicate in humans but don't cause disease and they're potential vectors. And then when you get to what actually has gone into human trials, it's really, as far as I know, only RAD4, uh, some vaccinia uh, vectors, a VSV vector, and uh, an AD26 uh, that Dan Baruch's developing that has just started its phase one studies. So as far as I know, those are the only replicating vectors, but I think uh, measles, CMV are, are going to come shortly. So just to talk about uh, our flu uh, as a model, model system. So there's, uh, there's some obvious uh, similarities b uh, between HIV and influenza. They have highly variable, changeable uh, hemagglutinins that are uh, important to, to neutralize, or he antigens such as the hemagglutinin or the envelope uh, that are um, important to neutralize. Uh, and, uh, influenza is variable, but it's shamed by HIV, which is substantially more diverse. Uh, and uh, I think it was Betty Korber said that the diversity of influenza sequences worldwide in any year are comparable to the diversity you see in one person at one time. Uh, and then they have uh, uh, well-conserved uh, sites that may be um, uh, good uh, neutralizing targets, such as the GP41 or the, in the case of, of flu, the HA stem. Uh, so our vector, our platform is AD4, a little AD7, and these, this is a military vaccine. So it's a vaccine virus. It's really used only in the U.S., though it's a, uh, a problem that's, uh, I know, was appreciated in Canada and, and in, the, in Europe. Military recruits get crowded into uh, uh, small uh, 
uh, barracks, they're stressed, and they get adenovirus infection. And years ago, uh, Bob Chanik and others at NIH discovered that you could give uh, the essentially virulent AD4 virus as a capsule and not cause disease, but cause an immunizing infection. Uh, so that's uh, the advantage. It's oral, it's uh, non-pathogenic, it's got a long safety history. It's been given to more than uh, 10 million recruits. Disadvantage is, one disadvantage, it won't uh, replicate in non-human animals, makes it harder to do good animal studies. And this is just a cartoon of how it's made, and uh, most replication defective adenoviruses are made by removing the uh, E1 region, uh, and then they're replication defective. We leave that intact, uh, but alter the E3 uh, region, which apparently can be uh, removed without um, uh, impairing replication, or at least impairing it too much. And just, uh, we can do studies in, in non-human animals, and this is a quick summary of studies in mice, which showed you, when you give it intramuscularly in mice, it doesn't replicate, so it acts like a non-replication positive vector, but it does cause immune responses. Uh, you can immunize the mice against AD4, and you can overcome it, uh, overcome that vector immunity, and you can even show that it protects mice from a lethal flu challenge. Uh, so we did a uh, did th these uh, very few preclinical studies. Didn't do tox studies because uh, they were considered uh, uh, irrelevant since the vector wouldn't replicate in uh, in animals. And we started a, a fairly large phase one study. And I won't go through all the uh, objectives, but basically safety as you'd expect. And then the primary thing was to look at. Uh, uh, immunogenicity, and it was a standard ascending dose phase one study. We went through five logs of, uh, uh, of vector uh, doses, and then and we gave it three times, and then we were able to get access to the uh, inactivated uh, pandemic H5N1 flu vaccine, and so we used that as a boost. And this slide, uh, complicated, but it uh, summarizes the results of that study. And on the left, the first column is just the dosage. So you can see we went from 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 11th viral particles. And the lowest dose is what you'd expect uh, is really the dose used in, uh, in the military vaccine. We had a placebo group. And then uh, when you go to the take rate, which was evidence that the vector actually replicated, you can see a, a dose response. Uh, uh, going from 50% up to 96% in the highest dose group. We uh, looked at antibody response. The, the immunogen was the hemagglutinin. Uh, and as you can see, there really wasn't much neutralizing antibody to the uh, uh, hemagglutin despite three uh, administrations of, of the dose of, of the vaccine, even at the highest dose. But when you look at uh, uh, cellular response. So this were this was uh, H hemagglutinin specific Ellie spot tests. You can see again a dose response, and clearly um, there was a cellular response. So the the virus was replicating and and demonstrate and showing its uh, hemagglutinin. Then when we boosted again, which is the uh, last two columns, you look at the hemagglutination inhibition um, uh, or uh, uh, seroconversion or the titer, you can see again a dose response and clearly an increase in um, uh, neutralizing antibody to the hemagglutinin. If you can, the placebo group got a single dose of the uh, H5N1 inactivated vaccine. The, uh, the other groups got that single dose, but they've been primed by the, uh, by the vector. And then this shows, again, dose response. These columns just show the different dosages. And in, um, uh, in, in the, the white columns show the uh, groups that had preexisting immunity to the vector. About 30% had preexisting immunity. And the gray columns show the, uh, the groups uh, without preexisting immunity. And you can see 
uh, again, somewhat of a dose response, but it's mainly in the group uh, that were pre that had pre-existing immunity to the vector. So the, when you go up, uh, you need to increase the dose to overcome vector immunity. Uh, and then in collaboration with Hannah Golding at uh, FDA, we did a, uh, she did a sub-study where she evaluated the, the quality of the antibodies um, induced by the vaccine. The main goal was to see, w were we getting uh, heterogeneous uh, cross-clade uh, responses? And this is a complicated slide, but uh, the, the middle group is the highest dose group, uh, and she, looking at seroconversion rates, so the, the uh, first column, A Vietnam, was the homologous virus, and we got 94% seroconversion. But the others are heterologous uh, H5N1 uh, viruses and the, neutral, and the hemo, uh, neutralization seroconversion rates. And you can see uh, they're still high, 83% uh, to 94%, while the control group, which just got the uh, inactivated vaccine, only had a 40% seroconversion rate, but uh, really had n little, if any, evidence of, of cross-clade neutralization. And then this is a, uh, uh, an attempt to look at it, uh, affinity binding uh, both to the homologous and to heterologous strains. In um, red is the lowest dose group, and in blue is the highest dose group, and the green is the unprimed uh, controls that got just the inactivated vaccine. This is an affinity thing, so the lower you are on the, on the graph, you can see the, the, the better the response. And you can see that there was a significant improvement in affinity to the HA1 uh, globular head of the flu virus, but not uh, on the right, not to the uh, stem. So in summary, what have we learned about capsules? Well, uh, I think I've gone through it, so I, I won't dwell on this, but uh, pre-existing immunity is uh, an issue. We need to uh, deal with it either by increasing the dose or perhaps by a different r route. And most importantly, we do get, a, with a prime boost approach, we get good neutralizing uh, antibody. Uh, so based on this, uh, an HIV investigator at NIH, Mark Connors, was interested. He wants to give this or has uh, given it, given our vector uh, by the uh, intranasal, just uh, aqueous solution uh, delivered like a, um, uh, like the like flu mist or painted directly on tonsils, again, an aqueous solution. And he, he thinks mucosal administration, one, will overcome pre-existing immunity and also more efficient uh, as an immunogen. Uh, and uh, th this is really, I won't go through this, this is really his, um, uh, his rationale for doing this, but the, the most important thing was he, he wanted to, one, determine whether intranasal or tonsillar was better if, as a mucosal route, and secondly, show how it compared to the uh, oral capsules. And again, just, I'm really talking about a, a mucosal vaccine, whether it's oral or uh, intranasal or tonsillar. And th this, because this was a respiratory virus, not attenuated uh, except by route, uh, he had to be a little more careful than we were in the, in our phase one study. He had to, he started very low dosages uh, and did a classic ascending dose uh, study and had an oral control, that's group seven at the bottom. And initially uh, we had to uh, ice, uh, do this at the, at the uh, NIH clinical center in contrast to our phase one study, which we really did as outpatients. And this is just a, uh, a picture of one person who got the vaccine. And this was the, uh, this was the reactogenicity that really associated with this. Uh, sore throats, a little um, uh, exudate, which lasted one or two days. Uh, and some of the people who got the intranasal also had uh, uh, a runny nose for a day or two. Uh, and then this is uh, kind of the goal, to, is the respiratory tract more immunogenic than oral? And on the top is the oral group looking at uh, uh, a uh, pseudovirus assay of virus neutralization and uh, day 60 and, day, uh, and week 26. And you can see there was uh, some response. Again, this is just a single dose, no, no boost. 
Uh, but with the tonsillar or intranasal, you can see a dose response and uh, much higher titers uh, after a single dose than with the oral route. And uh, this also showed maturation of response over time, the, uh, the H5 specific uh, mononuclear, uh, monoclonal antibodies, in cr which he fished out of these uh, patients, uh, increased over time, suggesting maturation. Uh, and then this is just a, uh, a graphic comparison of the, again, the neutralizing antibody uh, in the pseudovirus assay, oral on the left uh, at day 60 and, uh, and six months, and uh, tonsillar or intranasal on the right. And this uh, slide really shows uh, about that you expand the B cells uh, over time. Uh, which again, an important goal for HIV vaccines. Uh, so I won't dwell on the summary except uh, that a single, the main thing was uh, that the uh, mucosal route, or at least the, the nasal and the tonsillar route was uh, more immunogenic uh, in many ways than the um, uh, oral route. Uh, and based on uh, convenience and a little data, he's down-selected uh, the intranasal route to go forward uh, with an HIV uh, vector um, candidate. So now I'll talk about HIV. Um, so we have three uh, clinical studies planned or ongoing, or three studies planned or ongoing with vectors. Uh, the first one is the one at the, uh, NIH, which has just started. There's about, uh, I think, 17 people enrolled two received intranasal and the others uh, um, uh, oral. Um, uh, we're planning a study to start soon in the UK uh, with a, uh, an ad four that expresses the CN54 clade C vector. And then we're gonna, we are doing a challenge study uh, at it's, which is ongoing right now at Oregon Primate Center. And that has a, uh, well, I'll go through its, um, uh, it, its design. So this, this is an NHP study to, to look at the advantage, or at least the potential advantage of these replicating vectors and, and, uh, and also at the route. Uh, so it's a complicated study because uh, it's harder to, uh, to include uh, uh, primates in these studies than it is humans. Um, so it's a smaller study. Uh, we, uh, we, but we have three hypotheses in it. One, that the replicating vector is going to be m more uh, immunogenic uh, than the non-replicating vector. So to do that, we made a simian vector that is replication competent, a simian AD7, uh, uh, and then we use the AD4 vector in the, in the monkeys, but in the monkeys, it's, um, non -replic it's replication incompetent. Uh, so it allows us to compare replication versus non-replicating vectors. Uh, we are looking at the prime boost, so we're boosting with uh, an, a uh, protein. And then we're through in this third hypothesis, looking at GBV uh, as, a, uh, as a second way of improving immunogenicity to um, HIV. Some of you may know about these studies that were done by Jack Stapleton and others looking at co-infection with GBV virus, which is a, a, used to be called a flavivirus, which seems to be asymptomatic, but people co-infected with, uh, with uh, GBV and HIV seem to do much better than uh, people uh, who don't have that co-infection and, and have HIV. Uh, so we administered uh, the vectors, either uh, the, the replicating simian AD7 or the uh, AD4, the envelope uh, uh, E2 or ga and GAG. So they got three uh, AD4 or AD7 vectors at zero and four weeks, and then they uh, got boosted at, um, z at uh, uh, four and 16 weeks. And this is the design, again, showing the, uh, the, the priming at zero and four weeks, and then the uh, boost at four weeks, the protein boost at four weeks and 16 weeks, and then the challenge at week 20. The animals uh, are recovering from the challenge. Uh, the very, very preliminary data suggest uh, 
uh, that the uh, animals uh, are protected compared to controls in, in terms of viral loads in those that have gotten infected, and there's some that still have not gotten infected in contrast to the, uh, uh, the uh, control animals. Sorry. Uh, and then this is just a quick uh, summary of the uh, cellular response, which uh, actually was surprisingly uh, vigorous for, for both vectors, either the AD7, which is replication competent, or the AD4. Uh, blue is in is a cellular response to the envelope. Orange, which is kind of overwhelmed by the envelope, uh, is GAG. And you can see both replication and non-replication uh, good responses increased uh, certainly uh, at week six after the second prime and the first boost, and then at week 18. Uh, a little difference between the AD4 and AD7 favoring the replication uh, competent vector. And then this is binding antibody. Uh, so the first uh, group is uh, on the left is the AD7 uh, at baseline. Then you can see after the, uh, at week two, uh, you know, post, boot, post priming, and at the peaks showing post prime and boost for both um, uh, uh, the vector and the protein, and and uh, and then the uh, drop off, and then finally back up with the boost at week 16. On the left is the the simian ad seven, and on the right is the ad four vectors. So that really not much difference between them in the in binding assay. This is just the neutralization assay uh, to show we had clade one neutralization, but not uh, clade two, or not uh, tier two. Uh, neutralization. So, in our, so a quick summary: uh, these uh, vectors did prime and boost uh, for both envelope and gag. Um, the uh, the cellular responses were boosted uh, uh, by the bo by both the vector and the protein. Uh, the cellular responses do seem higher with the ad with the uh, re replicating vector in the monkeys. And, and uh, that same uh, on the challenge results. Uh, and then, as I said, the study's still ongoing. And I'll just finish with kind of what could you do to improve uh, uh, ad, uh, at least adenovirus uh, replicating vectors. One, we're, we're considering AD7. It, it may replicate better as a vector. At the, there's an AD26, which is also a human virus, uh, which is replication competent, that's being used as a, um, uh, a vector. And uh, Dan Baruch has just started his study of that because he doesn't have the experience, of, you know. 10 million vaccinees with uh, with the AD4. He has to do his study very carefully, so it's a little slow. He's doing it in an isolation unit. And then uh, we're thinking about uh, other envelope antigens. One advantage of the AD4 is, unlike most other vectors, uh, we can it will express the full GP160, uh, which may be an advantage, and we'll look at that. And then there's other ways of, uh, of of improving the um, uh, the vector itself, maybe uh, removing, uh, not even having an E3 dilution, deletion or using different promoters. So I'll stop here with just uh, the acknowledgments. We've had co collaboration and funding from a number of people. Thank you. I'd be glad to answer questions, I guess. Yes. For therapeutic vaccine, or are we simply are we only looking at, or we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Where are we with that? What does this mean the, for people living with HIV? Right. The mind? answer is uh, we don't know. We haven't tried that. Uh, uh, in theory, there's no reason we we couldn't. Though again, you'd worry a little more about giving a replication competent vector to someone who's immunosuppressed. Uh, so we'd have to go through that that slowly. Uh, 
So just to follow up, I mean, uh, realistically, and certainly in our country, uh, a lot of people living with HIV are no longer immunosuppressed because they're on uh, successful therapy. So would that that make a difference? Uh, of course, but to be frank, I, th you know, uh, I think, at least with AD4, uh, I think it would, you'd need to be careful, but even with immunosuppression, I think it would probably be safe. There, there, you know, adenoviruses are known to cause disease in immunosuppressed people, but there's very little with AD4 or even AD7 uh, in, in those people. So, you know, it, it, you'd have to, you'd be very cautious, but it's certainly possible, and it's a good point that a lot of people with HIV aren't immunosuppressed anymore. Um, I have a question <laughs> over here. Um, so this is a very interesting program that you outlined, really, of a number of different studies going on. And in the study that's going on, which I guess is called HVTN 110, it, it's sort of a larger tr size trial in consistent with their new program to try to, you know, get data earlier and, and move things along a little bit farther. So I wonder if you could talk about that um, uh, shift in how to design trials to get the information that you need to sort of move into the different phases and, and how that's going to happen with this particular product because, as you pointed out, there are a lot of interesting features about it. Sure. So uh, I didn't really elaborate. So what, what, what actually happened is we started this study at uh, the... HIV uh, study at the clinical center with Mark Connors, who had, who had done the study uh, with the um, uh, flu vectors. And uh, we did, it, it, it's not being done in isolation, so they're not hospitalized. Uh, um, uh, but there were, with, especially with the intranasal, there was concerns about, um, uh, you know, Transmission, and so the in, the small intranasal group have to be hospitalized at least after the uh, for ten days after their uh, infection. The, the the big concern actually in the trial uh, hasn't been so much safety uh, as uh, VISP. You know, we have an envelope antigen vector uh, making people seropositive. That's uh, you know they know that when they uh, go into the study, but now maybe their household contacts. Uh, might uh, get infected. So that's made this study very hard to enroll. And so because of that, we expanded the study in, in, and included, and now very recently started, uh, I think there's uh, 16 HVTN sites, or 12 HVTN sites. So it was partly be just to improve enrollment uh, we w went to this. Now in terms of HVTN uh, changes in I don't know, focus, I'm not sure about that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gerwitz. I'll now invite uh, Dr. Plummer to go for his presentation. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's really uh, quite an honor and a great pleasure. As I was uh, part of the team that uh, negotiated the uh, CHVI, which uh, I basically took up the whole summer of uh, 2006, and uh, a little frantic activity at the uh, at the AIDS conference in this this same facility in in uh, I think it was August 2006. So uh, I'm happy to see it. Uh, uh, come to this stage. Um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about uh, our work on trying to identify new technologies for HIV prevention. And uh, what we've been doing uh, as um, part of this, uh, this overall project to understand if there's natural protection against, or natural immunity, natural protection against HIV is um, to undertake an exhaustive analysis of mucosal factors in, in which are, are correlated with protection against HIV. Uh, conflict of interests, um, I, uh, the only 
company that I'm involved with as an advisor uh, is uh, Sightline Innovation, which is a machine learning company that is making a move into the medical diagnostics field, and so it has nothing to do with my research at all. So I'm not sure why they want me on their board, but anyway. But, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the development of HIV uh, uh, technologies for per uh, f uh, prevention technologies, where are we and where are we going? Well, I, I showed this slide yesterday, and I think everybody has seen this, that uh, it, the numbers of uh, infections with HIV in the world is still startling, and uh, uh, I compared the numbers uh, from the WHO in 2013 to those in 2007, and basically they're the same, uh, which uh, I guess if you're a glass uh, half-empty person, that's uh, uh, not very good progress. If you're a glass half full person, it hasn't in increased. So uh, I'm not sure where I am on that. Uh, we've had 32 years of HIV vaccine research, and we still don't have an HIV vaccine. Um, and uh, there have basically been three waves of, uh, of research. I think the wave that I've been most involved in is, is what I call a third wave, which is trying to understand correlates of protection so that we can mimic um, uh, that in developing uh, some kind of uh, HIV prevention technology, whether it's a vaccine or, or a microbicide. Uh, the HIV vaccine trials, I think uh, most people know about this data, but there have been quite a number of HIV vaccine trials. Um, the only one that showed anything was uh, a VaxGen RV144 in, um, in Thailand, which showed 31% efficacy, uh, not very uh, uh, not very dramatic results, but it's at least a result. Uh, s some trials uh, have probably done harm. Uh, and the current focus, uh, Dr. Gerber, the part is uh, uh, on uh, improving the Alvac Prime Boost strategy. Uh, as far as I know, there are no neutralizing antibody trials and no vaccine to try to induce neutralizing antibody, and there are no mucosal vaccine trials. Uh, so why is preventing HIV through some kind of technology so, so challenging? Well, HIV is a retrovirus, so it incorporates into the human genome. Uh, it infects cells that are important in the immune response. It, uh, infection itself does not uh, produce uh, completely protective immunity, although it does co um, immunity, uh, particularly cellular immune responses, does correlate with uh, a better outcome. As uh, Mark's already mentioned, uh, HIV is hypervariable, one of the most variable viruses that we've ever seen. It has immune evasion mechanisms. Uh, it only infects humans, so making uh, animal model studies uh, more challenging. It's a sexually transmitted virus. Uh, the window of opportunity for uh, prevention after exposure is extremely brief, and a lot of many of the topical agents that have been tried uh, or that have anti-HIV uh, properties are toxic. But why does uh, this seem to be an achievable goal? Well, HIV is uh, remarkably inefficiently transmitted for a virus that has infected so many people around the world. It, the per risk, uh, per exposure risk is less than one in a thousand. And it's usually only one virus that's transmitted, even though the individual transmitting the infection will have many viruses, uh, many different viruses uh, circulating. Uh, host immune responses are correlated with viral control in uh, HIV-infected individuals. Uh, and there is gr are groups of highly exposed uh, uh, uninfected individuals that appear to be resistant to infection uh, around the world, and that's been the focus of uh, my work for basically 30 years. Uh, you can produce broadly neutralizing antibodies, monoclonal antibodies to HIV, and in animal models you can see some protection against uh, challenges. Uh, we shouldn't be totally discouraged by all of this. I showed this slide yesterday, but it, it's remarkable. Uh, the time uh, from uh, identification of uh, an agent uh, and its association with the disease and the time a uh, vaccine was licensed uh, can be very, very long. Uh, and for some uh, bugs that we've been trying to make vaccines for for um, since the late 19th century, um, we still don't have anything. So what about HIV and microbicides? Uh, there's been a great deal of in vitro work on uh, uh, potentially uh, topical anti-HIV compounds and drugs. And beginning with anoxyl 9, there have been many 
clinical trials of compounds at the genital mucosa. Uh, none of them have worked particularly well. Uh, some have probably been harmful, particularly in anoxidil 9. Only one trial with tenofovir showed possible protection, but the most recent trial with uh, tenofovir uh, didn't show anything, uh, probably mainly because of adherence. Uh, so I think we need some other approaches to microbicide development than, uh, than what has been tried so far. Um, this slide I show often, and it's think a principle of biology that within a population there's heterogeneity and susceptibility to infection. Uh, and disease from infectious agents. Uh, it, uh, and beginning with gender, most vaccines have been developed through a basic understanding of, uh, of uh, natural acquired immunity to infection. We may not always understand what that, uh, what is mediating protection, but we know that there's protection. So our uh, story uh, goes to uh, starts in a slum in Nairobi where we've been working for 30 years. Um, it's called Majengo, and it's uh, quite a place. Uh, it's uh, uh, an area in which uh, there's a lot of uh, commercial sex and, and a lot of sex workers. And we've had the, like, the privilege to work there with these sex workers uh, since 1985. Uh, and one of the early observations, so when we started looking at HIV, and when we began looking at HIV in Kenya, it was really not known that there was a, a problem with HIV in East Africa. And we started a sex worker cohort to uh, look at uh, natural immunity to bacterial sexually transmitted diseases. And as kind of a side project, we thought, well, maybe we should uh, uh, have a look at HIV. And what we found was that two-thirds of the women in this cohort were infected with HIV, which is a total shock. There was no evidence, uh, apart from a little bit of lymphadenopathy, that anybody had disease. And there were no cases of AIDS in Kenya at that time. Um, and so we, and it was also at that time thought that uh, HIV was a disease of men. It was gay men and hemophiliacs mainly, and uh, was thought that women were relatively resistant to infection. Uh, which puzzled us because if women were relatively resistant to infection, how did two-thirds of these women get infected with HIV? Uh, and so in our first cross-sectional study of those uh, about 600 women, the, one of the most uh, interesting correlates of, uh, of being HIV infected was the length of time women had been in prostitution, but it was backwards. So the longer a woman had been in prostitution, the less likely she was to be HIV positive. And that can only happen if the population uh, is uh, selected somehow, so that in, the population becomes, in, in, over time, enriched with individuals who are less susceptible to infection because uh, others drop, the, uh, people who are most susceptible drop out of the, uh, out of the population because of infection uh, or, uh, or disease or, or perhaps death. Uh, and we went on to study that. We developed the hypothesis then that uh, there was a, a subset of individuals who were less susceptible to HIV infection. But uh, that's an impossible hypothesis to test directly because you can't, of course, challenge people with HIV. Uh, so w what we did was observe people over time in, in, in addition to uh, providing uh, uh, counseling and access to condoms. Um, uh, just observing the rate of seroconversion. And this is what this slide shows, the Kaplan-Meier plot of the, of the people who don't get uh, HIV infected. Um, and what we see is over the first two years of follow-up uh, in, uh, uh, in this cohort of initially HIV seronegative women, about 50% became infected with HIV. But after that uh, first couple of years, around year three, you begin to see a plateau uh, in which the risk of becoming infected becomes less and less and less. And even though you do see infections uh, long uh, into follow-up, uh, they become in increasingly rare. And it's about 10% of these highly exposed sex workers that be, uh, appear to be resistant to HIV. And th through a number of epidemiologic studies and uh, mathematical modeling, we're able to show that this is not a asymptotic decay to zero. It's, it, it's um, you know, there's some biologic explanation for this. So what do we know about this phenomenon that we call HIV resistance and others call highly exposed seronegatives? 
Well, several lines of evidence suggest that the HIV-resistant women are biologically and genetically distinct. Uh, we have a number of genetic markers that uh, correlate with, uh, uh, with resistance. Uh, there is clustering of resistance in families, uh, which strongly suggests that there's some genetic uh, basis for this. Although families sh share environments as well as genes, so it, you know, there so could be something environmental. There's a large body of evidence that suggests adaptive immune responses are involved, and I'm not really going to talk about uh, that today. I talked about it a bit yesterday. Uh, a phenomenon that we call immune quiescence seems to be part of the, this resistant phenotype, and I'll talk a little touch on that a little bit. But uh, the main focus of what I'm going to talk about today is the, our work on uh, trying to identify factors at the genital mucosa that might be involved directly or indirectly uh, in, uh, in mediating this phenomenon. So this is not the only group uh, of highly exposed uh, seronegatives uh, in the world. There are many others, uh, and it's been seen in uh, uh, female sex worker cohorts, in gay men who are highly exposed, uh, discordant couples, uh, and children born to HIV-infected mothers, and, and so on. Uh, and there's a large number of uh, groups around the world working on this, uh, and we've come together a little bit in uh, consortia to try to standardize some of the, uh, the approaches. So this is a slide I often show, and I don't intend to go through it, but what we're dealing with here is extremely complicated. Uh, we have a virus and a host and uh, uh, adaptive and innate immune responses, uh, mucosal and um, systemic responses, antibodies, and uh, cellular immunity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's genetic factors uh, in, in the host that uh, could be involved, or things like receptor polymorphisms and antigen presentation, et cetera. So if you're trying to study this or understand this by looking at one thing at a time, really doesn't give you uh, a chance of trying to understand this, because if you don't look at everything, you, you don't know if that one thing is important or not. So a little bit about my immune quiescence. Um, what we found in looking at the immune systems of these HIV-resistant women is that they have lower overall gene expression in CD4 T cells and, 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 um, and whole blood, uh, lower gene expression in, the, uh, uh, in a couple of interesting uh, ways, uh, insulin um, uh, Insulin um, metabolism and glucose metabolism are, are, are lower expressed for some reason. We haven't quite figured out that. They have uh, lower expression in, uh, in, in factors involved in HIV replication and in T cell receptor pathways. Lower resting uh, cytokine production from PBMCs. Uh, however, they have normal uh, antigen recall functions, so they're not immune suppressed. If, if you challenge them with the things like uh, flu or, or Canada, they have uh, uh, cytokine production. It's uh, no different than controls. Uh, so overall, their immune cells seem to be resting or, or quiescent in the absence of a challenge, and we term this whole, this whole phenotype uh, immune quiescence. So how might this uh, understanding this phenomenon contribute to some kind of new vaccine or treatment or prevention technology? Well, we might identify new episodes uh, uh, for vaccines. We might uh, be able to identify uh, uh, natural microbicides um, in the female genital tract or systemically. Uh, we might provide uh, uh, ideas for a novel approach to uh, immunization, such as a T regulatory cell vaccine. Uh, we see that uh, the T regs are increased in these uh, HIV resistant women, which might be involved in immune quiescence, of course. Uh, we may be able to induce uh, a favorable immune environment in, uh, at the mucosa uh, pharmaceutically, and uh, Keith Falk uh, and uh, uh, his uh, team have been working on that and have a presentation at, at this meeting that you actually can do that. Uh, it might be able to lead to new adjuvants or uh, uh, some kind of immunoregulation. So uh, what we think this immune quiescence phenomena does is produce uh, 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 an immune environment that uh, doesn't permit uh, efficient HIV replication. The immune system is quiescent. Uh, HIV 
requires activated immune system in order to replicate. And so if that is uh, not happening, uh, infection doesn't establish itself very quickly, and uh, the adaptive immune system can then uh, take over and get rid of the virus. So that's our hypothesis anyway. Uh, so we're, we've been studying uh, the female genital tract, which uh, um, it's not an easy thing to do. I don't mean <laughs> that as a joke, but it isn't. Uh, but that's a very important place to, to look for factors that might be involved, since 80 to 90% of HIV transmission in Sub-Saharan Africa occurs through uh, heterosexual contact, and it's about 60% of new infections occur in women. It must traverse the uh, mucosal barrier in order to produce an infection, and we can s see how that uh, uh, plays out with the seeing that uh, concomitant sexually transmitted infections or hormonal contraception uh, increase the risk of contracting HIV. And but HIV, on the other hand, is remarkably inefficient in traversing this barrier. As, as I mentioned before, the risk per sexual exposure is extremely low. So what we tried to do to study this complex system in, uh, uh, at, at a site where uh, it's non-sterile, uh, you can't really get a whole lot of, uh, of, uh, of material, uh, we've taken a proteomics approach as one of the ways in of, of uh, understanding what's going on at the, um, at the mucosal level. And we've, a, couple of the, uh, a couple of the approaches have been um, uh, to use uh, mass spectrometry directly uh, on proteins. Uh, the other is to uh, use uh, uh, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis to identify different protein spots. Our first foray into this field, we used uh, um, a technique called CELDI, surface enhanced laser desorbed uh, something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we identified uh, one protein peak that was uh, different in our HIV-resistant women, and that turned out to be a, a, a protein called trapin 2 or olefin, which uh, was interesting. It's an antiprotease and it has three forms. It's derived from uh, uh, epithelial cells and possibly ma macrophages. It has uh, antimicrobial activity and has anti-inflammatory activity as well. Uh, the second approach was to use a 2D gel electrophoresis to separate the protein spots. And we found, uh, and this is a, an early slide of 39 women, we found a, a number of proteins that were overexpressed in HIV-resistant women. And uh, these were basically, for the most part, antiproteases or, or protease inhibitors, so that 75% uh, of the many, many proteins that we identified that were overexpressed uh, were these protease inhibitors. And underexpressed proteins were interesting too, in that uh, uh, the majority, or at least a good portion of them, uh, were immune response uh, proteins uh, that were downregulated, so fitting in with the, uh, the whole immune coescence hypothesis. Uh, so these proteins were things like, uh, the upregulated ones were things like uh, serpin, the, the serpins and cystatin some of which have been uh, shown to have uh, anti-HIV activity directly. Uh, so you, if you look directly at the proteins rather than by the protein spots by ELISA, you see that the uh, antiproteases uh, levels in cer um, cervical vaginal lavages are increased uh, either by ELISA or by quantitative uh, Western blot. So the HIV-resistant women overexpress specific proteins in their genital secretions. Certain antiproteases, such as serpin-1, uh, for instance, can directly inhibit HIV and also has strong anti-inflammatory properties. They may be ideal candidates as potential regulators of, the, of this immune quiescence phenotype. Uh, and the function and expression regulation uh, is critical for or exploitation of these proteins as potential public health interventions, i.e. some kind of microbicide. Uh, it can show that serpin B inhibits HIV replication in a, in a reporter uh, uh, assay and in peripheral blood mono mononuclear cells. Uh, it's you know approaching the, uh, um, the inhibitory uh, levels that you achieve with uh, AZT. So most of these antiproteases uh, so sh some 
anti-HIV activity, uh, at least in vitro. And we're undertaking mechanistic studies to determine how these factors work and at point, which point within the HIV replication cycle do they act. Uh, the mechanisms likely vary and uh, likely affect multiple points uh, in the HIV replication. For instance, uh, alafin can affect both HIV attachment and in innate cellular antiviral responses. So innate immune factor expression varies considerably uh, between compartments of the female genital tract. No single compartment is the primary source of the expression. And we can be uh, again, expressed in highest abundance in the ectocervix and in the endocervical tissue. And a detailed understanding uh, of this phenomenon be, is important for understanding their role in protecting against HIV. And can we use this information to understand the regulation and, and expression of these factors? So all of this is preliminary, but uh, could uh, potential HIV interventions such as microbicide containing these and or other HIV inhibitors uh, be an important approach? And there has some evidence that epithelial cells may be a key regulator of the uh, immune quiescence phenotype, which would be very interesting. So we hope that by understanding the correlates of protection uh, and their mechanism of action, it may be possible to de develop uh, novel interventions uh, against HIV. And of course, you know, we're aware that co uh, correlation does not equal con um, causation and the biology of the lower fem female genital tract is very complex. I'll just quickly finish up. Uh, basically, I've said what I wanted to say. And uh, I'd like to thank and acknowledge uh, my many colleagues, both in Winnipeg and Kenya, who made this work possible. Uh, and uh, this is our, our group in Winnipeg uh, at uh, the CAR conference in, uh, I forget which year. Uh, and this is our group in Kenya, uh, in front of our new lab built by the government of Canada. And I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Mark. Oh, I can hear you. <laughs> Two brief questions. One, they're male sex workers. Is there any, you know, equivalent? And second is, couldn't you use a vaccine or uh, an imaging? Uh, in these uh, highly exposed people to see if you stimulate a different response uh, than people who, are, who don't uh, Yeah, we've uh, answered the loudest one first. We've done that with influenza and really didn't see anything. Um, we used an attenuated influenza virus and we didn't see any differences. Uh, there, we've not studied ourselves male sex workers. Uh, there are such things in Kenya. Uh, there have been studies that the um, uh, rectal mucosa in gay man and uh, find similar kinds of things. Adam Bergener, I think, has a presentation uh, on that here, or at least you can ask him about it. Thank you very much, Dr. Plummer. Um, I understand that we don't have any more time, uh, but I saw that a number of uh, participants had some questions. I don't know if our speakers will be willing to, uh, to answer any questions after um, to the session. So thank you very much to our two speakers and for everybody to come here today. Thank you.